view of this paper is we have sort of three things. So first of all, this data structure um, where we characterize string diagrams as structured close bands of AC sets, well, a specific kind of AC set. Um, and then we give some data parallel algorithms for sort of the things you want for string diagrams. So tensor and composition, um, constructing a diagram from a sigma term. A sigma term is a sort of formal binary expression tree where you build your string diagram from the individual operations that make it up. Um, and then applying a functor to a diagram. Um, and when I say data parallel, I mean, these are all defined in terms of sort of basic array primitives. So like concatenation of arrays or adding an integer scalar to an integer array. Um, and when those primitives are parallelized, so obviously like if you add a number to every element of an array that can be done in constant time in parallel if you have enough processes, then these algorithms are logarithmic and in the sequential case, they're linear. And that's in the size of the resulting diagram. Um, and then we have some applications. Um, so we use all of this to uh, basically take reverse derivatives of very large diagrams. And this is due to machine learning when uh, if you express your model as a morphism, uh, then you wanna take sort of a symbolic reverse derivative and then you can do things like gradient set. Um, but a sort of more general motivation for this, which I'm gonna get to in a sec, is as a general purpose data structure. So before I explain that, uh, I just want to be clear on what I'm talking about. So a signature, um, sigma, you have a bunch of generating objects. You might think of these as like types, uh, generating operations. So these are the things you're going to build your string diagram out of. So here we have a generating operation A, which goes from A to B, uh, and that's in the string diagram down here. And you plop all these operations down on the page and you wire them up how you want. Um, and the category free sigma is the symmetric model category 3D generated by your signature. Um, so the morphism for this category are actually these sort of formal expressions, but what we want is like a combinatorial representation. So we can really think of them as networks. Um, and the reason for this is because basically, uh, and also the reason I think this is a useful sort of general purpose tool is because this kind of you know, networks of operations pop up basically everywhere when you're doing like, you know, regular everyday programming. Um, I think one the most boring, but possibly most useful example is in orchestrating like workflows. So if you have like a bunch of stuff you need to do every day, like load this data from an FTP server, reprocess a CSV, stick it in a database. Um, this kind of workflow is like really great to describe with string diagrams. Um, because you have these like ordered inputs. And so if, you know, if your data after pre-processing needs to go into the database, then it needs to be fed into the right input. Um, and you also maybe need to feed like a table name in or something like that. Um, so, you know, this is one, one place where string diagrams are useful, even if you don't care about category theory. Um, they also get used in these kind of visual boxes and wires uh, interfaces that have quite, seem to be quite popular in, uh, graphics programs. So like game engines seems to use them quite a lot and also like visual effects. Um, this, this picture is from Unity's shader graph. Unity is a game engine. Um, and then a third uh, place where I've seen wild string diagrams in machine learning literature. Um, and they use this sort of a informal graphical notation. Um, but obviously um, the you know, the, the aim here is to make that completely formal. And, and this, when you specify your model like this, it should be executable, right? It shouldn't just be a, a picture that you help to convey. It should be like a, you know, a concrete thing you can compute with. Um, oh, am I, am I recording? It's being recorded, right? I just got a message. I'm going to assume yes, until, unless someone tells me the other way. Um, okay. So despite that, people tend to use graphs and trees for these sort of problems. I think the reason is that they're sort of well understood. You know, you have standard algorithms. You can go open introduction to algorithms and look up the, uh, I don't know, like breadth first search on an array-based representation of a tree. And so it's very easy to use graphs and trees, where it's not easy to use string diagrams. Unless, of course, you have access to a library. So there's some really nice libraries available. So CatLab is pretty pretty cool. DiscoPy, we just talked about yesterday. These are both really great. And I guess Chip, it has an implementation, but maybe it's not so much a library. Um, but you can't always use these because you know if you if you have really really large string diagrams and so you want to work with them on the GPU, then these libraries don't support that. So you're gonna have to roll your own. That's quite hard to do. It's a bit fiddly. 
Uh, and it's even harder to do if you need to make it scale up to you know, millions of operations. So the kind of goal here is to make like standard algorithms for implementing these things, which are, you know, they're fast. They should speed up when you give them enough processes and they should only have a small set of primitives. So you should be able to implement them in as many places as possible. Um, and also the kind of nuts and bolts definition, although they should be, you know, in terms of category theory, the nuts and bolts definition should make them, it should be simple enough to be implemented by people who don't really care about, you know, the free, the symmetric model category freely generated by blah, blah, blah. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna actually talk about the data structure. So uh, I claim that a string diagram like this, we're going to model as a structured code span uh, like this. So the source of this string diagram is A tensor B. And so the, the left foot of this code span is also A tensor B. Similarly, the target C tensor C, C tensor C, the right foot is gonna be C tensor C. And this thing G in the middle is gonna model the internal structure of this diagram. So all the internal wiring and operations. Um, so to do that, the first thing we have to do is understand how to uh, think about string diagrams combinatorially. And we're gonna start by looking at the hypergraph representation of string diagrams, which has a really nice exposition in this series of papers, string diagram rewrite theory. Then we're gonna see how to encode those hypergraphs as bipartite graphs. And this is something we previously did in, in this paper, the cost of compositionality. Uh, and where this diverges from that is instead of using um, adjacency matrix representations of those bipartite graphs, we're gonna use AC sets. Um, so let's look at the, the hypergraph representation string diagram. Uh, on top of the string diagram here, the operations become hyper edges and the wires become hypernodes. So hypernodes are these black circles. And you can, I mean, hopefully it's quite obvious how these two correspond. Um, these lines connecting a hypernode to a hyperedge, they are ordered. So hyperedge really has a list of source nodes and a list of target nodes. Um, and we're not only dealing with hypergraphs, but cospans of hypergraphs. Uh, and the feet of the cospan are discrete hypergraphs. So these handle those sort of dangling wires. Um, I actually the, the hypergraph we just looked at is also monogamous acyclic. So that means that each node has to appear exactly once as a source and exactly once as a target. Uh, and that includes on the interfaces. And that's going to guarantee that we're actually representing string diagrams of this category, free sigma. Um, because if we don't have that, then what we get is morphisms of free sigma plus frog. So if we take a new example string diagram, say this one here, um, now we've got, I guess I should say a new example hypergraph. Now this hypernode appears in the source lists of two different operations. And so that means sort of, sort of to, to deal with that, we have to introduce these generators of probs. We have to now be able to split wires. Um, and just for completeness sake, like this, this is the theory of special Frobenius monoids. So we have to add this to our signature. So we have to add these four generators and these equations. Um, okay, so <laughs> we've we've encoded our string diagrams as hypergraphs, but we've given them a combinatorial characterization. Now we are going to encode those hypergraphs as bipartite multigraphs. So this isn't too much of a step. Um, Basically, each hyperedge, well, hyperedges and hypernodes are just being, gonna become nodes. So on the right here, in this gray box, um, there's two kinds of node, the black squares and the white circles. Um, but these are all nodes, it's just a regular old graph, except edges only ever go between black squares and white nodes or white nodes and black squares. So it's bipartite. Um, but because hyper, operations no longer have this kind of ordered uh, inputs that we had in the hypergraph representation, we now have to number these edges. So this edge labeled zero here is saying that this wire represented by A, sorry, represented by this black square is going into the first input of G, the zero input. Okay. So what's a bipartite multigraph? How do we represent one? Um, well, we need a set of wires. So the, the black square nodes, we need a set of operations we need a set of edges from wires to operations. We need a set of edges from operations to wires. And these are notated like this. This is the input edges because they go from wires to inputs, output edges because they go from uh, operation outputs to wires. And we can think of this as a diagram 
Um, and these are those sets I've just described. And then the, uh, the maps in this diagram, we think of as arrays. So for each input edge, so from wires to operations, we have the wire that it comes from, the source wire, the target operation, and then the label. And although these are, these are finite functions, so we're going to think about them as arrays. I'll get back to that. Um, but basically, for each of the input edges, we have these three arrays. For each of the output edges, we have the three arrays. And then we also need to label our nodes. So we need to label each wire with the generating object of the category and each operation with its uh, generating operation. OK. Um, so <laughs> this, this diagram on the right is comes from this schema. So this is basically the source category of uh, a bipartite multigraph as a functor. So let me say that again, actually. So bipartite multigraph is a functor from this category here to set. Um, and that that's basically makes it an AC set. Um, I'm, I'm going to skip over this slide a little bit. So think about them just as these, these diagrams on the right. Um, and these things outside the gray box are the like attribute labels of each, each of the edges and nodes. Um, so that's bipartite multigraphs. That gives us the internal uh, wiring of the diagram and the apex of the structured code span. But as we said before, these the feet of this code span are discrete. Um, so we're actually going to think of them as objects in a simpler category, which I've called wires. Uh, and that category is basically uh, it's an AC set with a sub schema of the schema we saw before, but you can think of it really as just like labeled sets of the objects and maps between labeled sets have to preserve labels. Uh, and you can think of cospans in this category as just being Frobenius spiders. So this is an example of a, uh, a cospan in that category thought of as a Frobenius spider. Um, Okay, and then the final requirement is that we have to require these code bands to be well formed. And this basically just means that they're sort of compatible with the signature. So if we have something like this, where G has two input wires, but they're both labeled zero, that doesn't really make any sense. We have to have um, the labelings of input wires to G are labeled like zero, one, two, three, four, if uh, G has parity five, for example. But this, this down here is okay. Um, okay. So the, the sort of result here is that the structured code plans we described, where we have a well formed bipartite multigraph in center, and these A and B objects are from this wires category of labeled sets. Um, this is isomorphic to symmetric one of category freely generated by sigma plus frob. And obviously, we have the frob equations as well there. And if we restrict that to make these um, monogamous A cyclic, then we recover free sigma. And this is kind of expected because we're basically doing the same thing that the hypergraphs are doing, um, but with a sort of more concrete encoding. Uh, okay, so algorithms for tensor and composition. Uh, I'm going to use these as my running example. But before I do this, um, there's a slightly more economical representation of these structured post bands. So normally, we'd have to model this map as a full morphism of bipartite multigraphs. Um, which is because those are functors, this morphism would be a natural transformation that has lots and lots of components. Um, but it turns out we only really need to store one of those components, which is the component of wires. So we can really just think about um, one of these code spans as being a, a pair of finite functions. So from this set of wires to this set of wires and the bipartite multigraph in the center. Um, and these are, if we do this, then the labels are sort of guaranteed to be preserved because the way we figure out the labels here is just by following the map and looking up what the label on its target is. Um, that, that doesn't matter too much, but I'm going to be using this representation as two finite functions and a, and a graph a lot. Um, okay, so tensoring two uh, of these diagrams is pretty straightforward. You basically take your two combinatorial representations and you concatenate them. Um, well, it's con concatenation with a bit extra. So the source uh, maps you have to tensor, and this is basically doing a renumbering. So if, if on your original combinatorial representation, your, your wires were numbered 0, 1, and 2, then they would here be numbered 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, and obviously, you need to increment the numbers in this one to, to make that work. So that's what the tensor product is really doing here. It's just incrementing the numbers on the second one. Um, and the graphs, you just take the co-product and 
that's point wise. So you just take the tensor on combinatorial data and co product on the attribute data point wise. So um, for each component, you just compute something like this. And basically, it's just array concatenation. So if we want to implement this in code, and uh, this is pointed out in the original AC sets paper, which is really, really good, um, then you really just have to store an array and the co domain of the finite function. And then co products is just concatenation of arrays and Tensor product is concatenation of arrays, but you, you increment some numbers. Uh, and that's all you need to do. Obviously, you have a lot of these finite functions when you actually implement, but this is kind of the core of it. Okay, so composition. Um, the, the key idea here is that you first tensor these things, and then you identify some wires. Um, so here's the tensor of the two diagrams. And then we are going to identify the wires connected by red lines. And maybe a clearer way to look at this is like this. So all of the connected components colored red will be identified to a single wire. Um, and if we do that, what we get is down here. And you can see that all of the uh, all of these three distinct wires up the top here have been collapsed into one. And now it should be really clear why these genuinely need to be multigraphs is because we have parallel edges from this wire to this operation. If you had an adjacency matrix here, this would work. And this gives us the sort of resulting um, string diagram that we want. Okay, so uh, to make that a bit more like concrete, the sort of process of composition is you compute the co-equalizer, the target and source maps, using the connected components algorithm. And then you tensor your two diagrams together. And your source, your new source and target in the result, you just post-compose with the um, with the co-equalizer. And then you compute your resulting bipartite multigraph by applying the same quotienting to the tensor product. So here's, here's that in obscene amounts of detail. It's actually everything below this line is exactly the same as the tensor. The only thing that's changing is um, post-composing these components with the co-equalizer. And here we also need the universal map. Um, uh, so what this really amounts to is computing the push-out structure post bands. Uh, but by co-equalizer. And this is also what's done in the original AC sets paper. Um, they use union find, which is a little bit different, um, but that's kind of the gist. Um, all we needed here to implement this though, was finite function composition, which is just array lookup, um, like indexing, connected components, which in parallel is only log n complexity in the size of the, the graph you have to um, compute it on. And then computing the universal map, which is also only um, really array indexing. Uh, but it also seems concurrent writes, but an arbitrary write succeeds. That's in the parallel case. Um, okay, but even if none of that made sense, the, the key trick is that you tensor these two things together and then you quotient some wires. That's, that's all that's really going on. Um, so the reason why this runs fast is basically because we're only using a small set of primitives, uh, which have essentially linear sequential complexity and uh, logarithmic parallel complexity. And in all cases, we don't need concurrent writes except for connected components and, and when we're using the universal map. But, um, okay, so now we want to map uh, sigma terms to diagrams. And we said earlier, sigma terms are these like formal binary tree expression things. But since we've already defined algorithms for tensor and composition, we should just be able to do this inductively. So we go top down in this tree, we tensor these, the result of this and this, and that should work, right? Um, and of course, on the leaves, we need to map the individual operations to these like single thing diagrams. The problem with that is that we do a lot of intermediate work that's wasted. So we end up getting quadratic complexity because we have all these intermediate diagrams that get built up. That's quite wasteful. Um, although that the functor defined that way is quite useful for proving the isomorphism between three sigma and three sigma plus prop. So um, in any case, we don't want to do it that way in, in real life. So what we do instead is tensor all the leaves together. So that's this D0 tensor D1 tensor D2, and then wire all, everything up at the end. 
Um, the, the problem here is that we don't really know uh, what to quotient together. Like, how, how do we know how to wire it all up at the end? So basically what we need is uh, a pair of pal parallel maps, uh, which we're going to co-equalize. And those are, sorry for this slide, um, those are called the wiring maps in our paper. Um, I'm not going to get into this, but basically you can compute inductively two maps, um, which when you co-equalize them, it gives you the correct wiring. Um, now this sort of implicitly defines a recursive algorithm for computing them. Um, and, and this sort of process for doing that is, you know, as I said, you tensor the leaves, you compute the co-equalizer of those two internal wiring maps. You then quotient your giant tensor ring by that. Um, and, and you're basically done. Um, and in the case where you just have a single tree, a, a tree with a single node and two leaves, this is actually exactly the same as composition. Um, but, so we have, a, we have a sequential way to get these maps because it's, you know, it's recursive, it's top down. That doesn't really work well on a GPU. Um, so if you want to work them out in parallel, you have to do something di different. Um, I'm not going to go into the full details of that. But what I will say is that the trick is uh, working out which uh, composition node binds the sources of each of these leaves. So for example, the sources of D1 are going to be internal to this string diagram because it appears in the right-hand side of composition. And similarly, the targets of D0 are going to be bound as well. Um, meanwhile, the sources and targets of D2 are not going to be bound at all. So they're going to be on the interfaces. Anyway, the trick is you take this tree, you map it into something. So this is the same tree with the composition node highlighted. You map it into what I'm calling an ancestor graph, where you double each node. And then um, the right-hand side of the double nodes, you put a self loop. And then you just do pointer jumping. So you sort of walk up this tree and you can see that nodes in the right subtree of a composition node will get stuck here. Um, and the trick with pointer jumping is that you can do this in logarithmic time. Um, I'm not going to say much more than that because I'm way out of time. Um, so the, the sort of TLDR of this section is that mapping sigma terms to diagrams is slow if you do it naively, but you can amortize the cost by tensoring up all the leaves, uh, figuring out these wiring maps, computing wiring maps, and then quotienting the giant tensoring by those wiring maps. Um, and you can compute the wiring maps in parallel quickly. Okay, um, last bit. So applying functors to diagrams and applications to reverse derivatives. So um, applying functors is quite an obvious thing to need, but if you round trip via sigma terms, it's not great because if you have a diagram like this, then the size of the decomposition into a sigma term might be n squared. Um, because you need all these extra identities. And it's also not sure, even if you go to sigma terms, how could you map into uh, diagrams of lenses and optics, which I'll come to in a sec. So what we do to fix this is define this thing called a Frobenius stump decomposition, which is guaranteed to exist in, in a hypergraph category, uh, which when we add in the Frobenius generators makes free sigma plus bob, that is a hypergraph category. So we decompose a morphism like f compose g into this form, which looks like a mess, but actually it's just four spiders, four Frobenius spiders, and a tensoring of operations. Now, a tensoring of operations is easy to map because it's just a tensoring of diagrams. Um, and then spiders are also easy to map, um, and we provide a, an algorithm for that. Um, so that gives us basically an easy way to apply functors without leaving nice combinatorial land. And that means we can finally work with uh, reverse derivatives. So I'm going to go really quick over this. Um, if you think of a morphism, so a string diagram F from A to B as being a model, and its reverse derivative has this type, so it goes from an input, a model error, and it tells you how to change the model. Um, then what we need to do is compute R of F for a given F. Um, it, the reverse derivatives are like a functorial construction, so, but they're, they're as pairs. So if you map F to a pair of F and its reverse derivative, then you can compose them like this. But now we have pairs of diagrams and it's kind of tricky. It's not really clear how to work with those uh, and make it go fast. Um, so the solution is to use the built-in Frobenius structure and bend your wires around backwards. Um, and I just wanna 
quickly shout out to these two papers, which like helped figure this out, especially um, actually they're both pretty good. Um, but this one by Bruno really points out some efficiency benefits to the resulting diagram that come by doing things this way. Um, anyway, so now we're thinking about this, this kind of diagram as having kind of forward and backward information flow. So the outputs of RF are the backwards information flow. And when we compose these things, uh, we get diagrams that look like this. So the sort of change in um, input from G feeds all the way back in to F. And it, it's you get this kind of loopy uh, backwards information flow using the Fabinia structure. Um, and you can't really do anything with this because it's not a monogamous acyclic diagram. So this doesn't really correspond to a function because it has these Frobenius generators. But if you post-compose all of that with this adapter, then you recover a function, which in its forward pass computes your sort of model prediction and also how to change the model uh, to sort of update your parameters. And I know that was quite vague, but um, I'll ask, I'll answer questions <laughs> about that. Um, okay. And I know I'm just about to run out of time. So I have a, uh, a reference implementation of this code here. Um, it's still it's still under development, but I am sort of actively working. Okay, and I'm, uh, I'm done. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you very much. So I guess we have time for one question, and then we will have to move on the rest to Zulip. So, is there anyone who wants to ask a question? We. Oui. Surprise, usually people want. So maybe online, is there anyone online wanting to ask a question? Okay, so maybe there will be more questions later on Zulip. Uh, I guess there's oh, kind of a lot to one. digest. Oh, I'd we had one, awesome. Uh, hey, well, nice talk, really nice talk. Uh, just a very quick question. I basically need an API for this. When can you give me that? Uh, do you accept Python? Uh, yeah, whatever. Yeah, I mean, it's um, it's there on the, if you go there, there's like documentation and um, you should be able to just, just use it. On the website, it says that the diagrams library is in progress. So oh, I haven't updated yeah. the website. There should be a docs link. You, should, it, you can pip install it. Okay. Now. If you do cool. pip install Yarrow dash diagrams. Okay, then yeah. I'll, I'll check it out. Thanks. Is that, is that Fabrizio? Yeah, yeah, sure. Oh, hey, how's it going? <laughs> okay, thank you. So, uh, do you mind unsharing your screen? And sure. Guido, do you want to 